Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our webinar. My name is Angela Kaida. I'm an associate professor and Canada research chair at Simon Fraser University, and I will be your moderator today. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the Canadian webinar series on implementing the WHO guidelines on sexual and reproductive health and rights of women living with HIV. Today is our first webinar of the series where we will focus on trauma and violence aware care. This webinar series is a collaboration between the World Health Organization's Department of Reproductive Health and Research, CHIWOS, which is the Canadian HIV Women's Sexual and Reproductive Health Cohort Study, the Canadian Positive Peoples Network, Oak Tree Clinic at BC Women's Hospital, Women's Health and Women's Hands Community Health Centre, the Canadian Aboriginal AIDS Network, and the IBP Initiative, alongside many partners across Canada working on sexual and reproductive health and rights of women living with HIV. I would now like to ask Elder Valerie Nicholson to officially open our webinar with words of welcome and remembrance. Next slide. Quay. My grandfather named me the one the eagles watch over. My Dene family named me Nodiwenda, which means wolf eyes. I am Mi'kmaq on my dad's side and Haida on my mother's side. I'm a mother of four boys, a grandmother of three grandsons, and one granddaughter. This totem is of the land that I'm speaking from, the ancestral, traditional, unceded territories of the Coast Salish. We open our arms to welcome, as I welcome everyone here today. It shows our hearts are open and that we do our teachings and learnings today with not just our minds, but with our hearts and our spirits. And we do this in a good way. Our hands are up is showing thanks. Today we thank all the voices across Turtle Island, which some call North America. I welcome you to today's teachings and learnings from the language of the Musqueam Coast Salish, I will say Nasamat, which means we are all one. Next slide, please. Remember, take this moment to remember all those that have gone on before us and those that they have left behind. Remember, let their voices never be forgotten. Remember, thank you. Next slide, please. Thank you, Elder Val. Before getting started with our program today, I wanted to provide a brief snapshot of HIV among women in Canada. Women represent nearly one quarter or 23% of the 75,500 people living with HIV in Canada. It's about 16,600 women living with HIV. And HIV incidence among women has increased over time. In 2011, 26% of new infections were among women, which is double the proportion reported in 1999. And importantly, HIV prevalence, incidence, and impact are inequitably distributed among women in Canada along several social axes, including poverty, indigenous ancestry, injection drug use and or sex work history, refugee and newcomer status, African, Caribbean, and black ethnicity, transgender, and lesbian, gay, bisexual, two-spirit, or queer sexual identities, with several points of intersection between and within these groups. And understanding such inequities and acknowledging the effects of systemic racism, sexism, criminalization, poverty, discrimination, and stigma is important framing for our discussions regarding experiences of violence and trauma aware care among women living with HIV. Next slide, please. A quick comment on definitions. Becoming trauma informed means recognizing that people often have many different types of trauma in their lives and women who have been traumatized need support and understanding from those around them. Our definition of trauma-aware care acknowledges that trauma survivors can be and are often re-traumatized while seeking care by well-meaning caregivers and community service providers. A trauma-aware approach seeks to raise awareness of and ultimately eliminate this harm. Next slide, please. We have several objectives for today's webinar, which you can see here on the slide. Um, importantly, I want to draw attention to two two particular objectives. And the first one is really around an opportunity for us as Canadians to provide input into the WHO um, consolidated guidelines on sexual and reproductive health and rights of women living with HIV. Those guidelines were released earlier this year and one of our colleagues from WHO will speak to them shortly. Um, but this is, uh, we really see this webinar series as an opportunity to respond to and provide input into those guidelines. And secondly, I'll draw your attention to action. Um, some of the key considerations and discussions um, that are had at, during these webinars, over the course of this webinar series, um, we'd like to use those discussions to inform um, a process and 
the, a process to develop recommendations for an action plan um, by the, the Ministry of Health in Canada to address sexual and reproductive health and rights of women living with HIV. I'll add that across the, plan, the four planned webinars in this series, we will collate the presentations, discussions, and priorities identified to inform recommendations for a national action plan. And this first webinar is our first step in that process. Next slide, please. We are fortunate today to learn from a diverse group of leaders in trauma-aware care from across Canada. Because we can't actually see each other on this webinar, we wanted to provide photos of each speaker. So now, um, you, can, you will know, everyone will know, that not only is your presenter incredibly informed, thoughtful, and well-spoken, but she is also incredibly beautiful. Next slide, please. A brief overview of our agenda this morning. We will begin with a presentation by Dr. Manjula Narasimhan, who will introduce and provide an overview of the WHO Consolidated Guidelines. Then Dr. Carmen Logie will present a research overview on violence and trauma among women living with HIV in Canada. We have reserved most of our time on this webinar for the implementation section, where we will hear from five speakers engaged in trauma-aware care programs across Canada, including Dr. Jesleen Rana, Jay McGilvery, Dr. Neera Pick, Tracy Conway, Wangari Thoreau, and Valerie Nicholson. We will then have about 20 minutes for discussion and question and answer, and we'll close with some next steps. Next slide, please. Finally, a bit of housekeeping information. Um, in terms of asking questions, throughout our presentations, please feel free to submit any questions using the text feature of this application. You can see it under the, in the control panel under questions. Um, while as you submit your questions, we will collate them, um, and at, during the discussion session at the end of the webinar, um, our team will ask questions to the presenter on your behalf. Unfortunately, we do not have the option of unmuting um, anybody's line to directly ask the question, but I hope you'll trust us to ask your question on your behalf. If you are joining by phone, you're welcome to send any comments or questions by email to Rebecca Gormley, and you can see her email address on the screen. If we do not manage to get through all of the questions, our organizing team will collate questions and send responses to all webinar attendees after the webinar. And questions and answers will be posted online with the recorded version of the webinar. Um, the webinar recording. So the, this webinar will be recorded and will be posted on two YouTube channels listed there. We'll provide the links at the very end of the webinar and we'll be happy to circulate that to you by email as well. And finally, um, you can see on the right-hand side of this control panel that we have attached several handouts um, that you can download for your viewing and for reference. If you have any additional references or tools that you would like to include as part of the package of this webinar, please feel free to send those our way. Next slide, please. On behalf of today's presenters, I wanted to declare that we do not have any conflicts of interest to declare. And on that note, let's please get started. It is my pleasure to introduce our first panelist, Dr. Manjula Narasimhan from the WHO. Manjula, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Angela, and hello, everyone. It's a real, real pleasure for me to be part of this series of webinars that form part of the efforts of the World Health Organization to disseminate this new guideline and strengthen and expand partnerships and support research and country initiatives to drive progress and improve healthcare delivery for women living with HIV. In the next few minutes, I'm going to give a brief overview of the WHO Consolidated Guideline on Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights of Women Living with HIV that was published in February 2017. More in-depth information on the guideline and its recommendations are available on the handout included on the right-hand panel, as well as the links to the webinars that were held for the PAHO region earlier this year. We will also be translating the guideline into French, and this will be available in the coming months. The rationale and the scope of this guideline was because in many countries, women living with HIV do not have equitable access to good quality health services, and they're also faced with multiple and intersecting forms of stigma and discrimination. 
Angela already mentioned this, but women living with HIV are also disproportionately vulnerable to violence and violations of their sexual and reproductive rights. Just to note that WHO guidelines are global guidelines and they're focused on the healthcare settings. And although this guideline is focused on women living with HIV, it is acknowledged that the sexual and reproductive health and rights issues are in many cases similar for all women. Next slide, please. Firstly, a WHO guideline is a document that contains WHO recommendations about health interventions, whether they be clinical, public health, or policy interventions. And what WHO means when we use the term recommendation is information about what policymakers, healthcare providers, or patients should do. And it really implies a choice between different interventions that have an impact on health and that have ramifications for the use of resources. This is a rigorous process which is followed in the development of the guidelines, including when looking at available evidence and the methodology of developing the recommendations. This methodology is described in the WHO Handbook for Guideline Development that's shown on this slide. Next slide, please. So, just a few um, of the guiding principles that led to the development of this guideline. Um, it really consciously adopts the perspectives of women, their families, and their communities. It's grounded in and advocates for a strengthened, comprehensive, woman-centered approach to sexual and reproductive health and rights. And what we mean by a woman-centered approach is that it sees women as active participants, as well as beneficiaries of trusted health systems that respond to their needs, their rights, their preferences in holistic ways. It is an approach that requires that women are empowered through education and support to make and enact decisions in all aspects of their lives, including in relation to sexuality and reproduction. It calls for strategies that promote women's participation in their own health care. And this approach recognizes the strengths of women as active agents and not merely passive recipients of health services. And it's organized around the health needs and priorities of women themselves, rather than HIV disease management and control prevention. Next slide, please. So the framework that was developed for this guideline places the key principles of a woman-centered approach of gender equality, of human rights at the center of the document. And in addition, it places value to both health interventions as well as a safe and supportive enabling environment. You see in blue here the health intervention sector, sectors and in purple the enabling environment. And both are important because it is recognized that while policies and programs and interventions to improve the health of women living with HIV can exist in some places, these alone are not enough to bring improved health outcomes in the absence of a safe and supportive enabling environment. So both are therefore important to reduce the sometimes significant barriers women living with HIV face in accessing and utilizing high quality health care. We recognize, however, that many excellent initiatives and programs and policies already exist in countries. And in implementing these global recommendations and good practice statements, countries can adapt them to the local context and build upon their national best practices. Next slide, please. So there are a few other aspects of this guideline that I just wanted to highlight. And unique to the development of this WHO guideline was a global community survey that was conducted by and for women living with HIV to assess the sexual and reproductive health priorities of women living with HIV and so that their voices could be placed at the heart of the guideline. This is the largest survey to date on the sexual and reproductive health and rights of women living with HIV, and it received participation from women um, living with HIV from 94 countries, ranging in ages from 15 to 72 years. And the members of the, um, of the development team for the survey and um, who supported the survey and developed the report, which you see on the slide, uh, are noted here. 
I also wanted to note that this guideline is intended to address women living with HIV in all their diversity. And this includes, but it's not limited to, women who are heterosexual, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, or intersex, women who use or have used drugs, women who are or have been involved in sex work, women who are single, married, or in stable relationships, separated, divorced, widowed, women who are or are not sexually active, women and girls who have undergone female genital mutilation, women who have tuberculosis, malaria, hepatitis B and C, or other comorbidities, women who are currently or have previously been incarcerated, detained, or homeless, women who are e economic or political migrants, women who are indigenous, women living with disabilities, as well as adolescent girls who have acquired HIV perinatally in childhood or during adolescence. This guideline tries to capture the diversity across age groups, emphasizing that health services that promote sexual and reproductive health and rights are important for women throughout all stages of the life course, from adolescence to postmenopausal years. Next slide, please. This slide has been kindly shared by the community of women living with HIV and was a result from the survey. And the results from this global survey shows these statistics on violence experienced by women living with HIV before and after their HIV diagnosis. And violence experienced by women living with HIV occurs, we know already, at many levels, from intimate partner violence, sexual violence, in relation to their family and neighbors, their community, in institutions such as during detention, but also in healthcare settings. The survey also revealed that for issues related to both mental health and violence, women living with HIV who also have other socially disadvantaged identities such as drug use or sex work experience even higher levels of both. Next slide, please. In conclusion to this part of the presentation, I just wanted to say that an integrated approach to health to human rights and gender equality really lies at the heart of ensuring the dignity and well-being of women living with HIV. And action on the recommendations that we have in this guideline therefore requires a strategy that's not only informed by evidence or that's appropriate to the local context, it really needs to be responsive to the needs and to the rights of the women themselves. This guideline also includes discussion of implementation issues that managers of health interventions and service delivery must address to achieve better health outcomes for women living with HIV. We have committed to this series of webinars for Canada, which are intended to better understand how best to implement this guideline. The impact, we hope, is to achieve better outcome um, for health and overcome barriers to service uptake to service use and continued engagement in health care for those who need it, to reduce stigma, to reduce discrimination, to reduce violence, reduce mental ill health, and the delivery of the highest quality of care for sexual and reproductive health and rights. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manjula. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Carmen Logie for the research overview. Carmen, please go ahead. Hi, uh, good afternoon or good morning, everybody. I'm really excited to be talking about the gender-based violence and trauma findings from the Canadian HIV Women Sexual and Reproductive Health Cohort Study, or CHIWOS. Um, next slide, slide, please. So what is gender-based violence? So we know that gender-based violence is quite a, an expansive definition. It includes um, acts perpetrated against people's wills. It's founded on inequitable gender norms and unequal power relationships. It can include threats of violence and coercion. It can also include physical, emotional, psychological, and sexual violence. And it can also involve denying resources or access to services. Globally, gender-based violence, or GBV, is an epidemic that compromises well-being among women and girls. We know that gender-based violence is a risk factor for HIV acquisition, and as mentioned in the previous discussion by Manjula, there's also a high rate of GBV among women living with HIV following diagnosis. In fact, the U.S. Center 
for disease control reported that intimate partner violence rates were twice as high among HIV positive women in comparison with the HIV negative counterparts. Syndemics is a theoretical approach that looks at the co-occurrence of social and health disparities and how these can impact individual and population level health. So the SAVA syndemic was named to discuss the co-occurrence of substance use, violence, HIV, and AIDS, and can be a useful way to understand the negative impacts of violence among women living with HIV. Next slide, please. So today I'm going to briefly touch on our findings regarding the prevalence of experiencing gender-based violence in adulthood among women living with HIV in Canada, look at what priority populations have higher prevalence of GBV. How does violence function to increase risk of HIV acquisition through looking at our four sex data and look at how it compromises access to care and health outcomes. And finally, to look at what is the prevalence of trauma in our population of women living with HIV. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, I'll be discussing data from CHIWOS um, specifically the baseline data from this longitudinal cohort study. So we used community-based research approaches and it was multi-centered, including Ontario, Quebec, and British Columbia, although now we have expanded to additional provinces. Uh, we used non-random and purposive sampling, working with a large network of peer research assistants who identified as women living with HIV. We also collaborated with HIV clinics aid service organizations, and community-based agencies. We had an expansive community advisory board networks across provinces as well as nationally, and we use social media. So specifically, we looked at gender-based violence through self-reported experiences of control, also known as emotional violence, physical, sexual, and verbal abuse. And we're focusing today on violence experienced in adulthood, so over 16 years old. And this section could be completed privately. And um, we'll be presenting uh, from a series of multivariable logistic regression analyses to look at factors associated with gender-based violence. Next slide, please. So the first analyses I'll be discussing briefly is the analyses on forced sex as a self-reported mode of HIV acquisition among women living with HIV in Canada. In fact, we found that forced sex was the third most dominant mode of HIV acquisition. So the first most dominant mode of HIV acquisition was consensual sex, approximately half of our um, sample, and followed by 20% but from sharing needles, and then for sex, so 16.5%, so 219 participants. Other modes of HIV acquisition included blood transfusion, perinatal transmission, and contaminated needles, among others. So what factors were associated with reporting HIV acquisition from forced versus consensual sex? So the higher likelihood of HIV acquisition from forced sex among women who identified as having landed immigrant or refugee status versus Canadian citizenship status, African, Caribbean, or black ethnicity versus white or Caucasian ethnicity, um, persons who reported post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms, and childhood experiences of living in a group home or foster care residence. So we conclude that forced sex is a significant under-recognized risk factor and mode of HIV women's acquisition that needs to be recognized in surveillance systems and clinical screening practices. Next slide, please. So we did find widespread prevalence of experiencing adulthood violence so 80% of participants reported experiencing any type of violence in adulthood. We had over half of participants reporting physical and verbal violence and nearly half reporting sexual violence or control. Next slide, please. And we did find there were sociodemographic differences associated with experiencing violence in adulthood among women living with HIV. Specifically, we found Indigenous women were more likely to report experiencing violence in adulthood than women of other ethnicities. We found regional differences 
where women in British Columbia were more likely to report violence in adulthood than in Ontario or Quebec. And we found differences across income brackets, where women with the lowest income of less than $20,000 Canadian, which is um, approximately the poverty line, people below the poverty line were more likely to report experiencing violence um, during adulthood. Next slide, please. And so when we adjusted for age, ethnicity, education, and income, we found that there were several factors associated with experiencing any form of gender-based violence in adulthood. And these really did map onto our syndemics theoretical framework. So we found HIV care, health, HIV care outcome disparities, including delayed access to HIV care. We found substance use differences where women who had been experiencing gender-based violence in adulthood were more likely to report current tobacco use and previous cannabis use. We found higher levels of racial discrimination, increased likelihood of having an incarceration history, and current symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. And this is important for the next slide. So next slide, please. Thank you. So when we look at post-traumatic stress symptoms among women living with HIV in Canada, we find that they're very, very common. Um, over half of women from our British Columbia sample and half of women from our Quebec sample and 40% of women in the Ontario sample reported post-traumatic stress symptoms. And actually the factors associated with post-traumatic stress symptoms varied by province. In British Columbia, it was associated with not being on antiretroviral medication, less likelihood of injecting drugs, and gender discrimination. In Ontario, we also found Post-traumatic stress symptoms were associated with gender discrimination and HIV stigma. They were associated with refugee and immigrant status versus being a citizen or permanent resident. And as discussed in my previous slide, acquiring HIV from forced sex. And in Quebec, post-traumatic stress symptoms were associated with a lower ability to disclose an HIV diagnosis, food in insecurity, and a history of incarceration. Taken together, these findings underscore the need for targeted trauma-informed practice when working with women living with HIV. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to briefly summarize the findings from this talk. For sex was the third dominant mode of HIV transmission at 16.5%. Reporting for sex as a mode of HIV acquisition was higher in a, so among people with um, unstable legal status, so people were landed immigrants or refugees versus Canadian citizens. There was higher among women who were African, Caribbean, or Black versus Caucasian ethnicities, women who reported mental health issues such as post-traumatic stress symptoms, and associated with childhood adversity experiences, including living in a group home or foster care. When we looked at our experiences of gender-based violence in adulthood, we found most women, 80%, reported gender-based violence in adulthood, with very high rates of violence, um, with over half of people experiencing physical and verbal, and nearly half sexual and emotional or control violence. And we did find, although we didn't have time to go in depth into this discussion today, that there were factors that, that differed depending on the type of violence. For example, women who reported control and sexual violence were more likely to report sharing needles for injection drug use. Sexual violence was associated with gender discrimination and control with HIV-related stigma. Taken together, we found that violence was associated with poor clinical, mental health, and social outcomes, such as delayed access to HIV care, mental health and substance use, and social disparities, including racial discrimination and lifetime incarceration, really suggesting incidemic of violence among women living with HIV in Canada. Next, next slide, please. To sum up, these findings really can inform practice. Our recommendations are that practice with women living with HIV is trauma-informed, addresses post-traumatic stress symptoms, applies a harm reduction approach to support women who are currently using drugs, who are formerly used drugs, that we screen for gender-based violence, and that we look at barriers to linkages to HIV care and support and learn how to address those barriers. Recommendations for action, we need to challenge and reduce gender-based violence. We need community and policy approaches 
needs to be looking at those intersecting forms of stigma and discrimination, including um, gender discrimination, racial discrimination, HIV stigma. And we really need to consider the complexity of types of violence and the high prevalence of violence and, and using a syndemics approach that acknowledges the interconnectedness of violence, mental health and substance use, and social inequities. Next slide. I would just like to um, point to some of the references in my final slide. Um, the next slide is um, thanking the CHIOS team, all of the participants, um, the opportunity to pre present to you today, and um, feel free to contact me and look for our, re our research on the CHIOS website and Twitter. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carmen, um, for that great presentation. I'd now like us to move into our series of presentations on implementing trauma-aware care. Um, this is the, the, the heart of our, of our webinar today, and we will begin with Dr. Jesleen Rana. Uh, please go ahead, Jesleen. Thank you very much, Angela. It's such a pleasure to be here. Uh, I feel so honored and privileged to be here with such esteemed colleagues and friends. And I just wanted to actually first start off by acknowledging and thanking the traditional landowners of the land on which I come to you from, which is uh, which are the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nations. And just for us all to remember, we are all descendants of either settler uh, colonies or immigrants, and to keep that in mind as we move forward. Next slide, please. So as a team, we really wanted for the implementation, implementation section to really uh, leave our listeners uh, with some tools that they can walk away with in terms of how can we be trauma and violence aware practitioners. And I think my role in the next five minutes is to really talk to you about kind of a bigger picture before we start looking at individual practice. And so first thing I think is so important for all of us to do is really reflect on the reality upon which we work and function in. As uh, was stated earlier, there's um, globally there's over 14 million people who are unaware of their status whether they're living uh, when they're living with HIV. And as um, Angela also indicated that particular communities and particular racialized and indigenous communities are greatly are affected greater than other communities and so as practitioners and, and folks who are working in the system we need to start thinking why is this our reality we often hear about how systems fail certain people but the reality is we are working within the system as a family doctor I work in it I make money from it and so that holds me accountable from it and so what can we do to take a step back and look at the system that we are truly a part of next slide please so if we think about oh, if we think about the history of Western medicine here in Canada, um, we have to acknowledge that Western medicine's origins really are linked to colonial practices that have had a ripple effect onto our populations even up to today. Phenomenons of othering has existed, and from its very roots and origins, folks have been historically sorted into racial taxonomies, which really reflects perceived gradations of human worth. And the reality is, race is really a social construct that's so deeply and often subconsciously linked to particular health narratives. And what happens when we start um, believing these narratives is we start to create ideas and practices based on stereotyping and exclusion. I think it's really interesting that there's a lot of research out there that really discredits the biological view of race. Um, yet today we look that research continues to look and adhere to the notion that biological differences amongst different racial groups are responsible for racial variations in health status. And I think if we are to be trauma and violence aware we need to challenge that that it's not in fact um, biological factors inherent in race but really it is the impact of social structures that have created disparities amongst different different races in different uh, communities and if we have racial assumptions and if we continue uh, to let race racial assumptions uh, shape institutions they're going to inevitably as good-minded as we are and well-intentioned it's going to continue to shape the way we um, we undergo our healthcare delivery models. Next slide. So what does that mean? What does that mean for us as practitioners? How can we really step outside of that? And for one thing, if we are to be trauma and violence aware, we need to start thinking as intersectional practitioners. And intersectionality is a, is a concept that was created by Kimberly Crenshaw, and it's a concept that describes the ways in which oppressive institutions uh, really are interconnected and examine and have to be examined together. We can't we can't continue to silo different communities and without looking them at as as whole. So 
Some examples of oppressive institutions are racism, sexism, homophobia, xenophobia, classism, ableism. So what we need to do to be as intersectional uh, providers is really let the narratives be defined by our patients and our, and our clients as opposed to the systems that we're trained in. Because if we start to think in terms of risk behavior or racial or biological um, basis of health, what we're actually doing is we're, we're imparting our judgment and we're only further perpetuating the the, his, the, the historical trauma that have, has uh, affected our communities because of colonization and slavery. Next slide, please. So as a big picture, before we actually start looking at our very individual practices, I think we need to start looking at ourselves. And we really need to acknowledge the role and the impact of trauma and its links to health and health behaviors. And that, that means acknowledging that we do work in a system that has colonial history. And that doesn't mean we have to perpetuate its history. It means we can start to change it. We need to be aware. We need to be willing to learn. And we need to be willing to step outside the norm. So if something makes us feel uncomfortable, allow that to to be a cue to really question our own power and our own privilege. And always remember our trauma-aware values of empathy and uh, compassion and always seeing our folks as strengths-based and resilience-based as opposed to pathologizing them through disease processes and at-risk categories. So just a few pointers as my last slide, as my last point here is really be aware of our pathologizing. When we say somebody's at risk, what does that really mean when we say be aware of our language? If somebody comes to us looking for opioids, are they called drug seeking or are they calling somebody who's using to cope with the pain of their trauma? And always be aware of notions of surveillance. You know, be open with your charts, be open with your documents. They are um, they're not our property and surveillance has the long history of colonization as well. And always, always, always use universal precautions for trauma, which I'm happy to talk about um, at, in the question and answer period. Next slide. And so lastly, my last thought is trauma and violence aware care is really not a single issue of trauma, but rather it's looking at the interconnectedness of all the beautiful things that come together to create our individual and collective narratives. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jesleen. Um, now, again, it is my pleasure to introduce Jay McGilvery. Jay, please go ahead. Hi there. Good day to everybody. Um, next slide, please. The, I want to start from saying this is where I am currently in Toronto, and these are the nations who have been on the land for millennium. I don't say this to go through some politically correct motion, but to acknowledge my genuine gratitude. The intergenerational trauma that exists within communities in Canada due to the cultural genocide of First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples plays out in many ways, including in health outcomes. I think one small step towards trauma awareness lies in my individual responsibility to reconciliation. And in fact, my presentation is a self-reflection as a clinician. Next slide, please. I think we have to begin by not seeing folks as the total of their trauma, even though we are talking about trauma. It is not poor them. All that does is distance us as clinicians and strip clients of any power. Not everyone wants to or needs to reveal their personal history of trauma. So it is up to us to make sure that we universally Provide care that enhances strength and resiliency without making any assumptions about anyone's history. I have been told by some that they have been asked, so how is your trauma and stigma? And it's not about being voyeuristic or ticking things off a list. It's about attitude and a broadly informed awareness driving our clinical practice. Next slide, please. So why do I locate? because it helps me to say these are the limits that I personally must address. This is actually a list of the biases I bring to my work. I feel I must name myself and my unconscious and unexamined biases. These become belief and with that the potential for a breathtaking lack of humility, personally and professionally. So remember these things and who I am when you're looking at the next slide. Next slide, please. These are the folks I work with. 
and it's such a wide demographic. I do not have first-time experience of most of these realities, so I can never assume that I know what it is like. So when we say to our patients, I know, I know, when, when they're talking, ask yourself, actually, do I know? Or am I really diminishing the, the reality of their lives? Because I think change begins with self-reflection. Next slide, please. So these are some of the elements of trauma. How does that play out in our healthcare setting? Is there institutionalized trauma? So think of these elements as we look at the next slide, please. Colonization is racism. Racism is trauma. The case can easily be made that we've just celebrated 150 years of white rule and domination. And this is how trauma has played out. I need to know as a clinician what somebody's viral load is for sure, but there is so much going on in somebody's life that affects their health. Next slide, please. I think this is a starting point for trauma-aware care where there is more than one culture because one of those cultures will be dominant and dominant culture leads to social determinants of, of health. The medical professions in our country have, have a history of being largely represented by folks who are white and I feel I have an urgent responsibility to examine myself and my assumptions as part of providing safe trauma-aware care universally. If trauma is a lack of power as care providers, we have to look at ways we inadvertently contribute to that taking of power. There are 54 African countries and more than 150 indigenous cultural affiliations here in Canada. White privilege and attitude, often displayed as racism, reinforces the lack of safety and care provision. How can I even begin to understand how to be an effective care provider if I don't understand and acknowledge the effect of somebody's personal history or how they in turn may view my casual display of lack of awareness? They may not feel as safe with me as they should. Next slide. It's never about guilt, however, but we do have to honor patient realities, acknowledge what we don't know and we need to recognize patient expertise. By giving that respect and the power we relinquish, we may be able to reduce the effects of trauma in healthcare. Next slide. So think of somebody with a history of sexual assault. Wonder how we could inadvertently re-traumatize someone within our healthcare settings? So think of trauma history as we look at the next slide. Next slide, please. This empty bed speaks loudly to how trauma in healthcare settings with the most compassionate of healthcare clinicians can occur. Look at what the bed is designed to do. Arms strapped down, you can see the arm boards. Legs are pulled open, wide and uncovered. Legs are strapped down, you can see the leg straps in this uh, picture. The patient cannot move away from being so fully on view, but they are fully awake objectified and vulnerable. This is a cesarean section and this happens multiple times daily just in my city. We need to look at this and every procedure that we participate in through a trauma-aware lens. Next slide. I can say that things that are helpful and supportive. The most important thing that I can say, I think, is to say that I see you. I am here with you. You are not invisible. You're not swallowed up by what has been done to you. And you are an expert, and we will work together. Thank you. Jay, thank you so much for that uh, wonderful presentation. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce and welcome Dr. Niora Pick, who's the medical director of the Oak Tree Clinic, which is the provincial referral clinic for women living with HIV in British Columbia. Please go ahead, Niora. Thank you very much, Angela. I'm really honored to be part of this webinar. Um, there is increased evidence that 
women actually experience trauma and adverse childhood experience is actually more common than we think. And so we, when we looked at she wolves, we actually found that 65% of women did experience um, trauma and violence in childhood. And this has significant health implications because ACE are strong predictors of later health risk and disease, as you can see in this pyramid. Next slides. When I see patients, I really try to understand best what they have gone through. So I really wanted to um, understand more the effects of trauma on health. And although this is an evolving field and still has been studied, there is increasing evidence that there is some neuroendocrine and inflammatory ongoing changes that affect both the brain and the body and in fact actually affect the prefrontal cortex which affects emotional regulations, self-perceptions and how women see others. So women survive the trauma um, but develop unhealthy coping behaviors. Next slide. And this has significant implication. Um, first of all, it increases the risk for HIV incidence. And then trauma specifically affects HIV health outcome because it affects adherence. And as we know, if women are not adherent, there is faster disease progression, more hospitalization, more morbidity, and indeed even more mortality, twice the rate of death. So I would argue that trauma is actually a key social determinant of health. I want to draw your attention to the fact that the HIV diagnosis by itself is frequently a trauma that women sometimes carry for years and is not so always addressed. And that's on top of the previous trauma they have experienced. Also, that the first encounter after the HIV diagnosis is critical and I've heard numerous times from patients that they were told they were HIV and the first encounter was so negative that they actually disengaged from care and didn't engage in care for years until they got really sick. There's also specific times related to HIV which are that make women very vulnerable, which are the times of HIV disclosure as well as pregnancy. Next slide. So what can we do about that? Well, there aren't very many models about trauma-informed care, and one that I found was very practical and useful and visual was the American one led by Dr. Ed Machtinger, which has four components. The first foundation is trauma-informed values, and then the three other dimensions are the environment, which should be free of triggers, as calm as possible to promote healing and engage the patients. And then they recommend screening, but they talk about universally inquire about trauma. And, and screening is basically normalized. Patients are educated about the link between trauma and health and PTSD and pain and then interactions and interventions can be offered based on the information provided. Next slide. However, um, the screening is not as simple as it sounds. In the previous slides, uh, when I looked at um, is, are there any implementation guidelines for in HIV positive women in Canada, I did find and that the Calgary group actually did a study and published it in AIDS patient care in 2015, where they implemented an IPV screening protocol. And they found that over 50% of the patients, act, of the women actually experienced violence and more common in First Nation, but only 22% have ever been asked about violence, which seemed to be a missed opportunity. However, the VEGA is the National Committee for Dealing with Family Violence, and this is a Canadian body that is not HIV specific. They don't recommend to do universal screening. They recommend, as you see on that slide, 
um, their lives, basically to listen to the patients with empathy, to inquire about concerns, emotional, physical, and social, to validate that you believe what they say and that they are not to blame, and then enhance safety and support. And basically, their approach is not to do universal screening, but to do some personal safety. Um, and then based on the well-being and the person's safety, to make the decision on ha how, when, and if to ask about IPV. Next slide. I wanted also to talk about another model, which is the model of the clinic that I come from, which is a woman-centered HIV care called Oak Tree Clinic located in BC, Vancouver. This is one of the few clinics that actually focuses on women and 81% of the clients are women. Um, it is following the women from at all lifespan, from delivery to the older, the geriatric age. And um, it is a holistic care where we work with interdisciplinary team. And along the 23 years the clinic exists, we actually added a lot of services. But we are part of BC and the cascade of care for women in BC, in spite of free healthcare and free antiretrovirals, has not changed as much as we anticipated. And we think that the missing link is actually trauma, and that's how we got involved in trauma-informed care. Next slide. So I wanted to share with you a few of other activities that we implemented to address trauma and trauma-informed care. First of all, we identified it as a gap and we haven't had standardized trauma-informed care. We're still working on the process. So one thing we did is we uh, trained the whole team and the emphasis on the whole team, administrative, front desk, everybody, not just clinician. We changed the environment to be more welcoming. We did body mapping. We work with the Indigenous Liaison Office at BC Women's to make it more culturally appropriate. And we wanted to give women a voice. So we did focus group and we added a comment box in the waiting room. We asked the women how they want to address the trauma for World AIDS Day 2016. And we did a portrait of, again, stigma, which is what women identified and just um, mentioning few words that they have um, experience in the past and how they feel now was very therapeutic for them. And then we expanded peer support. And we, just two days ago, we did a workshop on equity and, and enhancing care for indigenous women. And we also expanded our care by adding a female psychiatrist. Next slide. One activity that I found is really important is to do a culture safety walk. We just recently did one. Um, and so this is basically looking from patients' eyes with patients, how the clinic and the space from the hospital um, to the entrance and all the clinic space, how it can be more safety and less triggering for the patients. Next slide. Um, here are um, some tips. Uh, I don't have time to go into them. How to create a welcoming environment. I would say that of the 10 tips here, providing coffee and snacks is probably the most important because so many of our population are food insecure. Next slide. Here are also 10 tips on what every provider can actually do to support women experiencing violence. We heard from the previous few presentations um, some tips of that. I would mention that one important one is to make sure you see the women alone. We saw from Carmen's presentation that about 50% of the women have are experiencing still control issues. So we have implemented that at least at the physical exam stage, we ask the controlling partner to leave so that we get a chance to actually speak with the women and make sure we tell them we believe them and we believe in them. Next slides. There's also things you can do with yourself and with your organization and don't hesitate to challenge disempowering practices as you heard. And um, I would emphasize that we, um, the need to be present. The women has been invisible and um, were dismissed previously. They don't need it from us. So make sure you don't just look at the computer, that you actually look at them and be present for them. Next slide. Here is a typical example of our patients um, where the 
sometimes come with abdominal pain and no objective is found. So what happens frequently is that they are dismissed as drug seeking versus in trauma informed care. We would actually question the root cause, the history of the pain, acknowledge it and look for solution. And next slide. And so make sure you actually, the staff that is dealing with vicarious trauma can be traumatized. So make sure you address that. And if you're wondering, next slide, if you're wondering um, if this has any outcomes, then um, trauma-informed care is actually equity-oriented care. And here is some evidence that it may take a year, it may take two, but at the end of the day, um, this actually has outcomes. So here are some steps, next slide. Here are some steps that clinic can do to uh, improve trauma-informed care at the organizational practices, bring the benefit to the awareness of the organization, form a task force, educate all staff, create the framework, engage patient, develop protocols for response and prevent um, an advocate for life skill and everything. So due to, next slide, um, I would say that just as provider, we have the opportunity to create new patterns of health and well-being for the patients. And it's the women's rights, human rights, to live life free of threats and violence. Next slides. We need to provide holistic and multidimensional care. And I will just finish with a quote from the minister, a previous slide, Minister of Indigenous Services, Jane Philippot, who recently said, Physicians have moral responsibility to do more for Canada's most vulnerable population. Society grants MDs with power and privilege, and there is no better use of that power than to advocate on behalf of those who do not have the same opportunity. We cannot change the past, but we can create a better healthcare system that can holistically meet the care needs of women living with HIV in Canada with health equity and equality care to improve, improve future health outcomes. Next slide. Thank you, Niora. Next, I am honored to welcome and introduce Tracy Conway. Um, Ados, can you go next slide? Next slide, there we go, thank you. Um, to introduce and welcome Tracy Conway. Tracy, please go ahead. Hi, um, I'd just like to acknowledge that I am on the juncture of the Batchewana First Nations and the Garden River First Nation. Next slide. <clears throat> The meaning and full involvement or engagement of... Uh, Tracy, we can't hear you. You can't hear, okay. Um, meaningful involvement or engagement of women Tracy, living... Tracy, I'm not sure if she's on mute. No, is it working now? It's working, it's working okay, fine. Thank you. Okay, meaning and full involvement involvement or engagement of women living with HIV. Um, these terms are sometimes used interchangeably but are the same thing. Um, it evolved from GIPA or the greater inclusion of people living with HIV. There is no substitute for direct experience which can be considered a kind of experience if accompanied by the ability to communicate well and follows uh, the listed steps below. Um, it's important to acknowledge that women living with HRV are the cornerstone or the foundation of the work that we do. MIWA <coughs> came about to ensure that the positive woman's voice was present for work involving positive women and it is essential to recognize that these women are the experts when it comes to lived experience with HIV and women living with HIV. Next slide. Having community leadership throughout the process helps to ensure that the topic chosen and the work being done is important to the women that we serve. Uh, for example, the women's working group at the Canadian HIV Trials Network um, had a number of meetings with various stakeholders at the table when prioritizing projects to work on for women living with HIV and there was a consensus between academics, support workers, students and women living with HIV that trauma was the first issue we needed to tackle as it affected the majority of women living with HIV regardless of demographics and ethnicity. Um, and through that, uh, Manjula was brought in April to present the World Health Organization guidelines, discussions ensued, and the webinar series was um, developed. 
uh, and to also acknowledge that there is reciprocal mentoring and capacity building both from the individuals living with HIV to the researchers, researchers to people living with HIV and students, um, that we all have something to learn from each other. Um, and just remembering that the, this work belongs to the community and there should be nothing about us without us at the table. Um, next slide. <clears throat> in Ontario and recently British Columbia, the closure of women's specific HIV service organizations will continue to negatively impact the community's ability to provide a united voice on women's specific issues and gender inequities. Um, and I, I think uh, specifically within Ontario, that loss has been felt since about 2010 when voices closed and the ability for women um, to get together and, and prioritize together the needs that reflect the needs of the community as a whole has greatly decreased. Um, so it's our responsibility to help address these gaps and <clears throat> to provide opportunities for reciprocal growth and learning. Um, we also have to acknowledge um, some of the needs and, and compensation by community members and how that they need to have the ability to have resources available to do the work in a way that is meaningful. So sometimes this can mean phone cards for people uh, that don't have long distance plans so they can participate in teleconferences, um, computer training, and that we also need to acknowledge power imbalances that exist within our relationships. And we, we need to look at tokenization and not just having a positive woman on our teams <clears throat> just to have a positive woman, but that that positive woman has knowledge and expertise in the area that we're working on. Um, and that not to have one person be that person for all projects that we're working on, but that we look for the person that is the right fit for our project. Um, <clears throat> next slide. So it can be said that trauma survivors have symptoms and not memories. For example, depression, mental illness, addiction issues, low self-concept and esteem, and other negative coping mechanisms. <clears throat> a, mother, a woman who is a mother and her reaction to trauma will affect her children, her family, and all her interpersonal relationships impacting her quality of life so that we need to get to the root of the problem of as others have said and help them to uh, move forward in a positive way. Next slide. <clears throat> so from Chivos we learned that approximately 80% of, of the women surveyed um, had <clears throat> tra trauma. So if we look at that we, we can sometimes conclude that it might be underreported due to the way that the survey was administered, um, but it's it's fair to say that the vast majority of people that you come into contact with have experienced some sort of trauma over their life, and that an HIV diagnosis and can be a traumatic event in and of itself. <clears throat> Stigma, discrimination, and comorbidities or other illnesses compound the issue and impact coping mechanisms. There are often trust issues since many women living with HIV have had negative experiences with people in positions of power like child protective services, police, health and social service providers who are not informed on HIV um, and may have prejudices when it comes to working with individuals with living with HIV. <clears throat> we need to treat the whole person and recognize individual belief systems, whether it's a creator or a higher power or God, and what helps them through their difficult times. And I can't stress <clears throat> enough the importance that peers play in the role of women um, living with HIV. And I think a really good example <clears throat> of, of this and of community-based research was the Vis Visioning Health Project that was done by the Canadian Aboriginal AIDS Network. Um, that was a really inclusive project that involved healing circles and um, included 
community members throughout the development and implementation of the project and I believe there's some time a little bit later to discuss that more in depth um, and that's it. Wonderful. Tracy, thank you so much. Uh, next, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce Wangari Thoreau. Uh, Wangari, please go ahead. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Angela. I will be uh, focusing my six minutes on trauma and violence aware care um, in relation to immigrant, refugee, and non status women living with HIV. And I'll be talking from the perspective of service delivery at Women's Health in Women's Hands, uh, a community health center for women in Toronto. Next. Um, the mandate of Women's Health in Women's Hands is to provide primary health care services for racialized women from the African, Caribbean, Latin American, and South Asian communities uh, uh, in Toronto and surrounding areas. We work from an inclusive feminist pro-choice, anti-racist, anti-oppression, and multilingual participatory framework. And through multidisciplinary teams, uh, we address issues of access to healthcare using an intersectional lens uh, and within the determinants of health that are uh, important to, uh, to racialized women. Uh, and those uh, determinants listed uh, below uh, what we put into consideration. Next. Uh, we provide care to about uh, 3,000 um, uh, women in a year, uh, and out of that number, 12% are uh, women living with HIV. Uh, and for us, trauma and violence um, aware care should be uh, grounded in the reality of um, uh, immigrant. Uh, immigrant, refugee, and non-status women's lives. Uh, and any service provider who is interested in uh, dr developing trauma-aware, uh, trauma and violence-aware care, they need to actually have answers to the four questions that are actually listed there. Uh, what is the reality of this woman's life? Uh, what factors shape this reality? Um, how does this reality impact on access, navigation, and engagement with health, uh, with health services? And how, as a service provider, uh, can you mitigate this reality uh, to improve and facilitate access? Uh, it, uh, in the next couple of slides, next please, um, I will highlight some of the issues um, uh, to actually see how these questions are, can actually um, be answered. This is a digital story uh, uh, of, a, uh, of a young woman who migrated to Canada in 2007. Um, and she's discussing the types of um, uh, violence she has she had experienced, sexual, physical, uh, mental, neglect, uh, which intersected with uh, broader uh, issues of racism, um, homophobia, uh, as well as gender-based discrimination. And as a coping mechanism, this woman turned to drugs um, to alleviate um, whatever she was actually living with. Uh, and she talked about uh, feeling hopeless, as if she was stuck, uh, but also um, realized that this, was, and this situation won't, be, won't stay the same um, forever. Next, please. Uh, this is another digital story uh, linking uh, cultural, um, uh, cultural and traditions. A young girl who was born and brought up in Canada, um, she was taken back to her mother's home country when she was nine years old and forced to undergo female genital mutilation. And she discusses how this took away um, the rights to her body and her body being sexualized at a very young age. And she questions why um, is it important to, uh, to keep such type of traditions uh, alive. Uh, and for me, the question here is, when you're talking about cultural safety, sensitivity, appropriateness, how do we implement um, uh, service or deliver services um, when we don't see the hidden scars, the invisible scars, women may be dealing with and how do you do we interrogate such issues uh, as service providers next please 
this is a, a, a slide highlighting the importance of the determinants of health. This woman was talking about poverty and how it impacted her ability to get accessible housing, uh, experiencing food insecurities, and actually having to make choices about do you buy food for your family or do you take the bus to go and, uh, uh, and seek care um, uh, for, 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 for your well-being. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a slide talking about um, how fragmented women's, women feel about their lives as well as the fragmented services which they actually access. The first quotation talks about a woman who uh, seeking HIV uh, services cannot seek those services as a, uh, as a woman living with HIV. When she goes to other spaces as a lesbian woman, she only goes there with one part of her identity. And when she goes to um, um, uh, aid service organizations, she, enter, she enters them as a black woman. And her question was, when will I be a whole person? Her life was fragmented in different ways. And when you think about the way services are structured, uh, there are limited one-stop sh uh, one shop services for women living with HIV. Uh, in Ontario in particular, HIV care is provided within HIV clinics. Uh, which were traditionally um, uh, uh, structured around um, gay men who were struggling with HIV uh, originally. Uh, but um, women were expected to fit in those settings. Uh, hence, the importance of ensuring that we create a model that is based on women's needs, that where we can actually uh, uh, integrate um, trauma and violence aware care. Next, please. Um, Next slide, please. Uh, and based on all those issues, women's health has actually developed a model uh, of care for women living with HIV, which is framed within an anti-oppression framework. It involves partnerships and working with allies to facilitate equity, integrates the determinants of health, uh, and is grounded in the particip participation of women living with HIV as leaders, um, invo which involves them in uh, uh, directly in the delivery of, uh, of their care, recognizing their right to be treated with respect and with dignity, but also recognizes that for immigrant refugee women, they live in transnational spaces, uh, which may impact the day-to-day -day realities. Next, please. Uh, and um, uh, in addition, this model should be grounded on sound, uh, on sound uh, research, uh, should be linked, should link service delivery um, to research and policy as a continuum, but also integrates the political and economic forces that actually in influence women's health. So we would propose uh, uh, such a model. It actually integrates all the issues we have been talking about uh, right from the beginning of, the, of this webinar. So thanks. Next slide, please. There's Wangari's contact information. Thank you so much, Wangari. Um, next slide, please. And at this point in the webinar, I, I just want to take a moment um, to acknowledge our partner and to acknowledge the leadership of Indigenous women in Canada and Indigenous organizing, organizations in highlighting the role of systemic violence and trauma in women's lives, and as well their role in advocating for trauma-aware approaches that are by, with, and for women living with HIV, and which are grounded in tradition and cultural safety. Next slide, please. Well, thank you so much. I want to, I want to thank all of our panelists for their excellent presentations. Um, we're, we're giving you a virtual round of applause. Thank you so much. Um, I'll encourage uh, pa attendees of the webinar to please type any questions that you might have into the text feature of this of your control panel. Um, and now we'll move to the question and answer period. So um, my, our first question today, um, I will pose to Niora. Niora, here is a question for you um, that asks, at Oak Tree Clinic, how was the cultural safety walk done? Did a patient do the walkthrough like a quote, hidden shopper? And the, uh, the question asker says, sorry for a consumerism analogy. If you could answer that in, in uh, one or two minutes, that would be great. Hi, thank you for the question. Um, in fact, 
We, at this point, we only did a virtual tour two days ago, and we have connected with the um, First Nation Liaison Office, and we are planning definitely to involve patients from both. We have a significant First Nation and significant African population in our clinic, so we definitely plan to involve um, patient representative from all and do it with the clinician. So this is one of our actions to do in the next few weeks, actually. Thank you, Niora. Um, perhaps let me, let me ask this question to um, Wangari. Wangari, a question interested in how care providers are engaged in addressing the lack of HIV counseling support. Um, among physicians conducting HIV screening for Canadian immigrant medical exam in the context of trauma. Maybe, if, Wangari, if I can ask that question to you first. Hi, thanks for the question, um, Angela. Uh, I think for Women's Health, we have actually, um, we've been developing our HIV care model for the last 15 years, and we've been refining it. And we actually have a multidisciplinary team. Uh, we have an HIV, um, uh, an HIV care uh, interdisciplinary team, and it includes uh, uh, clinicians, therapists, um, community health workers, as well as, well as our research um, uh, uh, has representation on our research team. So, and for, for, for quite a long time, We've been talking about how do we do um, assessment for women uh, who are entering into our care, and how do we, so to determine uh, what are the issues they're bringing into care, uh, and how do we provide the care that is actually, uh, that is actually um, provided. So we have, um, it's, a, it's a work in progress. Uh, we improve as, uh, as we go along. Um, and we, 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 after we do the, uh, the discussions at the interdisciplinary team, then we provide training for the entire staff at Women's Health and Women's Health. They're all familiar with the HIV program and how it should be implemented, starting all the way from intake up to the um, provision of care and retaining of women in care. Thank you, Wangari. Um, another question, I'll, I'll direct this first to Jasleen, and if any of other panelists would like to weigh in, please let me know. But Jasleen, a question around intersectionality and applying intersectionality. So can you speak a bit about um, how or how do you or how should we apply intersectionality in our research and our practice? What does that look like in practice? Hello, okay. Um, thank you for the question and I'm so glad you asked. Um, that's a really good question and I could talk about it for an hour, but the reality is um, being a, a practitioner with an intersectional lens really means about, it, it really begins from the moment you really start your interactions with your client or patient, whatever way you're interacting. So it really, it, if, you're, if you start to acknowledge that maybe the person in the room who's with you and your goals might not be exactly the same, acknowledging that their goals are just as important, if not more, than the ones that you may have set out for them. Because sometimes, like as, an, as a family doctor, I, have, um, I, I always do an intake with, my, with the patients when they come in, and they often come in with the idea that all I'm going to talk to them about is, is HIV. And that's actually often not even one of the things that comes up at the first, at the first encounter. So really it's about, I, I often, I have a series of questions I ask about like, how do they prefer that I call them? Are they comfortable? Um, how, are they comfortable where they're sitting? So first it really begins about the setting that you create in the, in the room that acknowledges that this is a human being who has a history, has a narrative that's influenced, and probably this person has been traumatized by healthcare services in the past. So really the setting that you create uh, is the first step for me. And then the second really is my language. So I, I often will put everything out on the table and acknowledge that not every person will necessarily want to talk about their trauma or their stigma or maybe what they want to talk about is just 
starting medication and, and getting their viral load suppressed and then when they're ready, whether that's in six months, a year, five years from now, will bring up other things that they want. But I always kind of, in my intake, I really set it up that I'm, I'm more than just, I, I really, if they, if they feel ready and when they feel ready, I really want to be more than just their prescriber of antiretrovirals and the person who checks their blood pressure and viral load. So for me, what practicing as an intersectional practitioner really means is being aware that of my, my body language, my physical language, my cues, but at the same time, I have set up my practice that my first meeting is always an intake in which like health priorities are, are talked about. And, and, and to be honest, what often comes up is uh, uh, people are surprised that I want to talk about their, if they want to talk about their families. A lot of the people I work with have gone through really traumatic migrations and have left their children behind. You know, we, we talk about things like that. And so for me, having an intake where I talk about what their goals are, what they really want out of the relationship with me is, is, a, is a good starting point. Jay, you want to add to that? Hi. Uh, yeah, it's Jay McGillivray. I think the, 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 uh, the, what the things that Jesleen has said are really they're they're the core of the thing. It comes back down to the respect for the fact that the person sitting in front of us is an expert in their life, and that in order for us to be able to appropriately provide care, we have to make it comfortable for them to be able to talk to us about all of the things that affect their health, and also have the humility to know that we don't know everything that happens in people's lives, but we have to make it safe enough for them to tell us. It's not just, as Jasleen says, about the viral load and the blood pressure, but why is the viral load high? Why are they unable to take their medication? Why did they miss their last appointment? Do they not have the money to get to the appointments? Are they gonna lose their precarious job because we're taking too long to see them in the office? There are so many pieces that go together to form the mosaic of people's lives and we have to be open to hearing those. Thank you so much Jay and Jasleen for very thoughtful responses. Um, perhaps I'll ask a, another question. Um, Carmen, can I direct this question to you? Um, in your presentation, you, you demonstrated a very high prevalence of violence, multiple and intersecting forms of violence reported among women living with HIV across Canada. Um, can you give us a sense of, is that, is, is that level of, of uh, violence comparable to women living with HIV in other settings? Um, and is it perhaps, how does it compare perhaps to women who are not living with HIV in Canada? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a really great question. I believe we found that the rates of violence were, I think, almost 13 times higher uh, with women living with HIV in our sample at 80% than the national prevalence in Canada, which I believe was 6%. But it is comparable to the study that Manjula presented earlier, where it was over 80% of women globally. Um, experienced violence. So I'd, I'd have to say that while the rates of violence among women living with HIV in Canada are much higher than among HIV negative women, they are comparable to that global survey of uh, prevalence of violence against women in, in multiple contexts. Great. Uh, thank you for that response, Carmen. Um, I'll just mention here, there's a few questions coming through for requests for slides or um, requests for being directed to particular uh, resources presented in some of our presenters' slides, and we will certainly um, be able to provide that to you after the webinar. So even though I'm not asking your question out loud, please know that we will provide any uh, links to requests being made through the chat box as well. Um, I think on that note, I, I wanted to share a comment uh, from one of our colleagues from the Canadian Aboriginal AIDS Network who, who says, personally, I think that intersectionality has now become an academic theory and definition, but in reality, all of us, everyone lives an intersectional identity. Literally, we can think about this as a physical interaction, like on the road. And to me, the, to, to Monique asking this question, is the question is now, why are we only recognizing this now? And what, why does that have to be credentialed by academia? 
And she says, can we make space like trauma-informed care to always have this and think about decolonizing practices that al would allow this from the get-go and as practitioners to do the work internally to make this possible for the communities that we work with. I think that is a, just in a really, really important way. Um, oops, my apologies. Um, it's from Jeff Danforth, these comments. Um, and I think that's just a really important way for us to think about this, that just because academia uh, may be, you know, applying language or, or, you know, applying some theory towards our discussions, I think women and uh, community practitioners have long understood and acted on understanding intersectionality and viewing women as holistic, as complete lives rather than um, on segregating different parts of identity. I think that's a very important component. Um, I think at this point, we've, we have collated all of the questions that have come through. If I did not uh, get to your question or if I did not ask it properly, please forgive me. Um, we're working real time here, but please know that we will, again, collate the questions and respond to any requests um, after the webinar is complete. Um, but at this point, I'll, I'll have to bring the discussion and question and answer period to an end. I want to thank you all for participating and for your insightful questions and valuable feedback. Um, we will be posting a recording of this webinar alongside the panelists' responses to the questions at the, at, um, the links provided, I think probably, yes, no, back back one slide, right there, here we go. Um, the link's provided on these two uh, websites and we will be sure to disseminate those, uh, this information widely through our networks. Um, in terms of next steps, if I can get the next slide please. As we mentioned, we are um, collating the discussions and recommendations um, put forward throughout the webinar series to inform a, a, the development of a Canadian action plan to address sexual and reproductive health and rights of women living with HIV, including, of course, the priorities highlighted from this first webinar on trauma and violence aware care. I mentioned that this is a webinar series, so I will ask you to please save the date for our second webinar. Um, you can see here it's on Thursday, November 16th, um, at this same time slot, depending on your time zone. And the, the selected topic of focus for that second webinar is supporting safe HIV disclosure. I, I, I really hope that you will be able to join us and continue this important conversation. One more thing to say is that the, the slides that were presented today will be made available to everybody um, and we're going to undertake a process to translate all of the slides into French um, so that we um, can, can have both, both versions of the slides will be available, one in English, one in French. Next slide, please. On this note, on behalf of our presenters, I want to thank you all for participating and for your thoughtful comments. Please join me in thanking the presenters, IBP, WHO, and other stakeholders who made today's webinar possible. I'd like to turn it over to Elder Valerie um, to help close us from what is an important but, but, actually, but really quite emotional and difficult uh, topic of conversation. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. As we are speaking, a woman is experiencing violence right now. May we take all these teachings and may we learn from them and teach our learnings, make it full circle. Remember those that we research are not just a statistic, we are women first. I live with HIV, but it does not define me. I honor this journey. From the words of Crowfoot, a Blackfoot warrior and storyteller, what is life? It is the flash of a firefly in the night. It is the breath of the buffalo in the wintertime. It is the shadow which runs across the grass and loses itself in the sunset. From my language, Nemotus, till we meet again. Thank you. Thank you, Elder thank Valerie, you. and thank you to everybody for joining us today. Um, we look forward to, uh, to meeting with you again in a few weeks, um, and we'll follow up again with you with the links and uh, additional resources and documents emerging from this webinar. Thank you, and we wish, wish you all a wonderful rest of your day. Safe journeys.